Hello, hi, it's GoGate Engineering Institute once again, and I promise to take us on the structural analysis and design of a bridge structure. Comprehensive structural engineering analysis and design of a bridge, taking into cognizance a live project. This is GoGate Engineering Institute. Recall that it's it's customary for us to take us. Um, periodically on various aspects of structural engineering such as performance of linear elastic analysis um, that first order elastic analysis analyzing structures for the stiffness matrices where elastic behavior of the structure structural response is taken into consideration um, first order inelastic analysis where you have material nonlinearity and um, second order effects such as what you have when you're analyzing a structure that's a gap element in SACS or um, a tension type structures like in the case of pylon, pylon type structures or monopole structures or um, lattice towers as the case implies. But today we want to focus our attention on the structural analysis and design of a bridge. Bridge structures are very complicated structures and the engineering design requires a very high level understanding of the technicalities and structural engineering, foundation engineering, and structural hydraulics. So there's the geometric aspect of bridge design, and then there's the structural aspect of bridge design. So you have to set out your bridge um, based on several considerations. You know, you have the approach structural engineering, you have the exit structural engineering, the design of slope stabilization structures, riprap structures, and the like. But I will try and make this as very quick as possible, uh, despite the fact that there's a whole lot of technical nitty-gritty associated with this. Um, this is done to Eurocode. Performing bridge design to Eurocode is very complicated because there are several Eurocodes that relate to the structural engineering design of bridges. There is the Eurocode 1, 2, which is the traffic loads on bridges, um, train and railways and foot, foot bridges. You have Eurocode 2, 1, you have Eurocode 1, 5, which relates to thermal loads on bridges. Um, you then have Eurocode 1, 4, which relates to the environmental loads on bridges, okay, such as your wind loads, as the case implies. And then you also have Eurocode 0, which is the basis of design um, required for. So all these Eurocodes come into play when you want to carry out the structural engineering analysis and design of a bridge. Now, the very first thing you will have to do as a structural engineer is to set out your, um, your alignment of your bridge. Typically, you will have to conduct a geomatics, or what we refer to as a contour survey or a geotetic survey around the location where the bridge is going to be situated. So, this is an example of a geomatics for the client that was provided, showing the location where the bridge is going to be. You would use the geomatics to develop a plenary set out location of how your bridge would span. Now the code of practice gives you guidance and gives extreme technical guidelines on what you would take into consideration in setting out your bridge. It tells you what your slope, minimum longitudinal and transverse slope should be, the number of notular, not, notional lanes and the width of notional lanes. The critical notional lanes, all of these are specified in the Euro code. Um, Euro code one to provide the guidance for the structural engineering and actions and of traffic loads on bridges. It is extremely comprehensive and highly technical. This is your guide in the structural engineering design of a bridge. So this this is a 26 um, meter bridge. Um, the bridge is spanning between two abutments. This is the abutment on the left. That's one on the right. The bridge slopes one percent in longitudinal direction, and then it slopes one in fifty in the transverse direction. This was comprehensively modeled. It was modeled as 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 it is. You have an approach slab, okay, which which constrains the active earth stress. Okay. The approach slab is used to reduce the the extreme life surcharge associated with moving heavy heavy S V hundred or S V ninety loads onto the bridge. Okay, the requirement is that you should ensure that your failure plane intersects with your, your approach slab. Your failure plane from the base of your abutment should intersect. So, 
the requirement is that your failure plane should be at least 60 degrees okay to the intersection of your um of your if i take a line arbitrary line and i rotate this by 60 degrees which is the expected failure plane of the soil the backfield soil you could see that is the existing grid this is the embankment of the bridge so if i project this up to here you would see that it interfaces okay so 60 degrees interfacing which is the potential failure plane of the stabilized soil beneath the approach so this is what guides your consideration in your design selection of your approach lab and then we have the exit slab and then the bridge slopes in this direction those are your peers and then you have the peer cap and all of that so the first thing to do is to develop your structural analytic model based on your your initial philosophy your structure analysis model would have to be a finite element analysis model. This bridge has two lanes. It's a three span, it's a three span gather bridge. Um, and the total length of the bridge is almost about 20, 28 meters. Now there are two lanes, each lane is three meter wide, and then you then have pedestrian foot footpath. It's designed with a pedestrian footpath. Okay. So the pedestrian footpath is what you actually see on that side. So if you see, if you look at this, you see there's a raised curb. The raised curb is three inches. The code specifies that the minimum raised curb, the UK National Annex specifies that the minimum raised curb for your um, for your bridge should be 75 millimeters, right? So the raised curb is 75 millimeters, and then you have humans passing here so this is the walkway path so you have the footpaths on your bridge and then you then have the two lane two national lanes now what are your loading considerations the design of a bridge is heavily comprehensive and complicated and there are several load considerations that will have to be taken into cognizance these load considerations is what is going to be explained quickly and then um, succinctly now the first thing is that you have dead actions the dead actions comprises of the asphalt the asphaltic finish on the runway deck you have your the weight of the deck itself you have the weight of the gathers these are dead loads so i'm referring to dead loads now you have the weight of the bridge pairs you have the weight of the pier cap and then you have um, dead surcharges as a result of the embankment on the approach and exit section of the bridge and then you have the weight of your uh, um, your abutment as well as weight of appurtenances in this case we are designing the uh, parapets without handrails and now um, imposed loads you have on the bridge uh, loads such as live surcharges you have live surcharges on the uh, on the approach and exit sections of the bridge in accordance with rakhine head stress theory you have the lateral head stress you have both at rest head stress and active head stress the at rest head stress is used in the structural design of the bridge okay in compliance with eurocode 7 i forgot to mention that eurocode 7 is also a code of practice that also pertains to the structural engineering design of bridges now the at rest head stress is used to compute to check the um the, the structural limit states at ultimate limit state design while the um, active air stress is used to check the stability of the bridge structures under due and equilibrium is typically under equilibrium limit state so for the structural design of the bridge you require the at rest air stress okay that's where there is no movement of the soil into the bridge components now you have so these are the so you have to compute the loads on the superstructure which comprises of the bridge and then the substructure which comprises of the pier and pier cap as well as the um, the abutment now there is what you refer to as your bearings in your design of a bridge you have to ensure your your supporting framing philosophy where you're going to have your mechanical sliding and mechanical rest vertical restraint bearings it is very crucial that in your design your framing philosophy of the bridge your bridge should not superstructure should move independently of your your substructure the bridge should move independently of the substructure so if you look at what is being done here you see that this bridge slopes this is, this is a model to slope um, you would find out carefully that we have the mechanical bearings you design with the mechanical bearings 
the mechanical bearings you compute you derive and compute the stiffnesses of the mechanical bearings accurately from the vendor catalog okay but i will just take us um um quickly around the loading consideration so that we understand how these loads were computed and how they are applied i won't speak about the load combinations because they are extensive but i'll just run through the various load consideration i've talked about the dead loads um the imposed loads for the abutment you compute the input loads from the abutment based on the height of the abutment and the cross-sectional characteristics of the abutment and the type of fill okay behind and in front of the abutment and your consideration for your repra okay um now the abutment the code of practice the euro code specifies that you also have to cater for vehicular lm1 load so the loads catered for in the engineering design of bridges to euro codes are under a classified they are classified under four categories they are classified based on what's referred to as tandem systems so we have load model one is a tandem is a tandem load criteria for design of bridges there's an axial load criteria you have load model two you have load model three and you have load model four look up the euro code and understand comprehensively the technical requirements for these load models now load model one and load model three are the critical load load models that will be computed in compliance with the code requirements in the engineering design of bridges now uh, when we look at what is done the code specifies that for the design of the superstructures you must take into consideration these load models in addition to the design of the substructure and the abutment structures so it provides what the load model to be used for design of abutment structures and the load model to be used in the design of the superstructure so this is the load model for the design of the abutment structures these load models in addition to what's referred to as the dynamic dynamic consideration due to impacts that is to say um, wheels that are vibrating on the on the um, structural entity while um, there's an ing um, there's a movement into the bridge so it caters for what refer to adjustment factors and then dynamic effect as well too so it tells you what the wheel load is and then the contact pressure and then how to compute the um how do you calculate the wheel load so you get the wheel load and then you get the um the axial load first of all because this is a tandem system um, and then from the axial load you get the wheel load and then you take into consideration the overload factor the code specifies the corresponding references are shown on your screen and then you obtain what you refer to as the wheel pressure on the bridge deck so this is the wheel loads that are computed for the abutment this is the this is the load model for um the design of abutment so this is load model three and then this is load model one so there's load model one design of abutment and there's also load model three okay you must apply these two lo critical load models in the engineering design of an abutment the code also specified that longitudinal breaking force should also be catered for in the design of abutment the breaking force which acts tangentially tangential to the surfacing of the bridge deck is computed as 60 percent of the vertical load okay in compliance with this section of the code 4.92 now um, after computing the loads on the superstructure on the abutment sorry the next load consideration is the load models that you have to compute for the deck itself so for the deck the load the code specifies that the loads are divided into lanes you must subdivide your your runway into identifiable lanes now for the design of this bridge that we are looking at here this bridge is, is an eight meter span bridge plus um we have 900 for pedestrian walkway so eight meters plus 1.8 on both sides that's about uh, sorry we have the carriageway as three three meters sorry which is six meters plus 1.8 that's 7.8 and then you have the width of the um the width of the parapets okay the crash barriers which is about 500 on both sides which is one meter making a total width of 8.8 .8 meters for the bridge now so total width of the bridge of 8.8 .8 meter the natural length of the bridge um if we look carefully so we have the that's the bridge deck we have the carriageway and then we have the lane so that's lane one and then we have this is lane two 
okay and then um, that's the footway footpath and then this, this is the parapet okay so you define your lanes you define your natural lanes in accordance with the code of practice because your natural lanes will provide the criteria for identifying the influence line influence line in structural mechanisms can be defined as the distribution of a structural quantity at a point as a result of moving loads okay this can be defined as the the distribution a chart or a curve that shows the, the change the distribution of a structural quantity that quantity could be shear force it could be bending moment it could be reaction at a point as a result of change in position okay of loads along the span now the influence line for moment on as a result of moving loads is a point where the center of gravity of all the wheel loads and the center of gravity of one load is at equidistant from the center line of the bridge deck okay or the bridge span so this is a three span um three span bridge it's not a continuous bridge design it's a simply it's a simply supported um a simple supported mechanical bridge design so you have the deck supported on mechanical bearings so i showed you the layout originally so these are the mechanical bearings that are also designed in the course of the analysis now so you would then apply these are the i was referring to the imposed loads on the deck now you have the vertical imposed loads for lm1 is divided into two lm1 load criteria in compliance euro code is based on an axial load and uniform pressure load so the axial loads are divided into the natural lanes you have um, axial load for lane one axial load for lane two and then axial load for lane three okay this requirement is captured succinctly in table 4.2 of Eurocode 1 2. It specifies the axial load for lane 1 and then that for lane 2, that for lane 3, and the corresponding universal distributed load, which is the pressure load that accompanies the axial load. So, this is what you're going to compute, and then you're going to apply them correctly. Then, longitudinal breaking load, you have to compute the longitudinal breaking force, which is a, is, it's a force as a result of breaking action on the bridge deck. Okay, the code says it's 60% of the total axial load. So 60% times 2 times the axial load gives you 1.2 and then it's 10% of the pressure load on the bridge deck. Okay, then you also have to compute the transverse centrifugal force, this is breaking force, then this transverse centrifugal force and then you have to then compute the LM3. LM3 are abnormal vehicular loads that is expected to transverse the bridge deck. So abnormal vehicular loads must be applied in line with the influence line on the deck. You can see how I computed the influence line on the deck. The first thing is to check where the resultant force of all the axial load is, is, is occurring with reference to an origin point. And then you must ensure that the location of that resultant force and the location of one of the wheel load are equidistant from the centroid of the bridge span. That's the yield line. It is based on this criteria that when you apply your load for your LM3 on the bridge deck, you must apply it along the yield line. Okay, the yield line for moment, the yield line that will provide the critical moment. So if you look at the LM3 as well, so you will find out that this was arranged carefully in such a way that it is it is going to provide it is arranged along the yield line the resultant of this um, axial load is on the yield line that causes the maximum moment okay the maximum moment on the bridge deck this is a requirement from eurocode eurocode one two um, united kingdom national annex if you look at the um, code criteria the code specifies that um, so if you look at um, NA2164, it specifies very clearly that the in order to produce the most severe load effect on the section being considered, the SV vehicle should be applied on the influence line in its entirety, and that should not be truncated. So on the influence line in its entirety, and that should not be truncated. So this is what guides your loading 
um, um, your loading criteria. So you can see that was done. Um, so this is for the L, um, LM3 LM3 loads. You also calculate and compute the LM3 loads on each of the notional lanes of the bridge. Now we have what's referred to as accidental loads. The code specifies that um, along the, the race curb on the pedestrian walkway, there is possibility that in the event of an abnormal um, consideration, maybe a drunk driver, he could ski away and then slide into the pedestrian walkway. You must design the pedestrian walkway for this abnormal accidental design condition. So the code specifies, the Euro code 0 specifies your design conditions such as transient design condition, persistent design condition, accidental design condition, seismic design condition. So these are the design conditions that are captured. You look at this Euro code 0, it captures the various design conditions that should be catered for in structural analysis. So it tells you the, the design condition that should be catered for. So you have persistent you have accidental, you have seismic, like I said, and then you have transient design conditions. So these are the design conditions. Accidental design condition actually refers to an exceptional condition where in, in the case of bridge design, you could have vehicle, you know, skiing off its, its natural lane and coming to the pedestrian path. So you must design the pedestrian walkway for these load considerations. Now the code specifies that you must also design um, for thermal expansion as a result of changes in temperature of the installation temperature. So you must design for thermal expansion as a result of that. So your elastometric bearings design also is a function of your thermal expansion and the shear stiffness of the bearing part. For heavy loads, you there are several kinds of bearings. We have fixed bearings, we have sliding bearings, and then we, we also have mechanical bearings. We then also have um, elastometric bearings so um, you also have pneumatic bearings which are rarely used elastometric bearings are what you would want to use in the design of this structure we are designing the structure to the superstructure to move independently of the substructure so as not to um, transfer extreme lateral loads onto the bridge um, onto the pier bends so if you look at the, in the analysis of the elastometric bearing, you have to determine what the, um, the installation temperature of the bridge is from the shade temperature. Um, Euro code 15 make this provision. And then you have to check, um, determine what the environment and maximum ambient temperature from your design basis is. And then you get the increase in temperature. And you also get the decrease in temperature and calculate the tensile and compressive forces on your elastometric bearing. This also provides the guideline for sizing your elastometric bearing, getting the shear deformation and the thickness of the bearing part. Now, this will give you a requirement as to whether you're going to use laminated bearings or you're just going to use rubber bearings. Now, um, the code specifies that for the deck, you also have to analyze for um, vertical temperature variation. You will see how we apply these instead. And then we have environmental loads that has to be calculated very, very comprehensively for the bridge. For bridge designs, you calculate environmental loads in three orthogonal directions, lateral, transverse, and vertical that could cause uplift. Okay, lateral, transverse, and vertical. The code specifies that you would have to comprehensively compute the wind loads for all the substructures, superstructures during installation and then during operation of the rail bridge command. So let's look at how this was applied. And so firstly, we have the self-weight of the bridge. So you can see that's the entire self-weight of the bridge. Um, um, okay, so we have that. And this includes that of the, uh, of, the abort, uh, of the bridge um, superstructure, first of all. Um, super and substructure, the gathers, the, the bridge deck, and then the the piers. I would like to mention here that um, now analysis of bridges are done. There are several approach for performing linear elastic analysis of bridges. Um, if you look at the Federal Government Highway Manual, which is a code of practice in in this country, um, it specifies that you. You have what's referred to as um, method of analyzing bridges, structural engineering design of bridges are classified in under various methods. So we have um, we have hands, but also you have elastic analysis. You also have plastic analysis of bridges. Um, you have what's referred to as the grillage methods, where you have beams 
that are um, so you have the bridge decks that are subdivided into beams and then analyzed as various units okay uh, you have Hensburg uh, method you have finite element analysis uh, methods of an analyzing bridges and then you also have the yield line method yield line methods are for plastic engineering analysis of bridges okay so the method of analysis anal analysis for what we are doing is finite element analysis which is a comprehensive engineering analysis where the bridge deck is comprehensively discretized and then you have the structural stiffness matrices that are generated for each of the entities in the local coordinate system and then aggregated transformed to the stiffness matrices in the global coordinate system by the utilization of the transformation matrix and each of the discretized entities are then aggregated and then the force displacement constitutive relationship for the structure is then used to solve and determine what the internal and external forces and deflection of the structure would be okay having said this um this is the bridge self weight i just talked about that now um this is the direction let's look at the side view the bridge slopes in this direction right so this is the entry this is the um, entry point and then that's the exit right so um entry that's the entry abutment that's the exit abutment the wing walls are not modeled with the structure because they are designed separately um they are designed separately because they are not designed to be integrated into the um abutment so that um uh, bridge stresses are not transferred and then i forgot to mention when you're designing bridge there are three types of abutments you have what to call integral abutment design you have what to call semi-integral abutment design and then you have what's called cantilever abutment design the type of abutment design that is being considered here what's referred to as semi-integral abutment engineering structural design so now this is the approach um self weights for the approach abutment right and then this is the asphalt asphalt self weight this is the self weight of the asphalt both on the bridge deck and then on the um on the pedestrian walkway so you have asphalt we are going to pave both the the bridge deck and then the pedestrian walkway now um this is the the backfill the abutment backfill it to be filled with cohesionless soil the terrain is very it's very low so like i referred originally i told you that the geomatics will have to be looked at and that from that we have the terrain elevations and all of those and then we use that to work out set out your geometric design of the bridge so um this is the approach abutment this is the backfill um that's the backfill on the exit abutment okay so on that side that's the exit abutment this is lm1 so this load model one lm is load model the code specifies the load models to to use so these are the derived load model loads so you have to uh, you have to cater for the vehicular load models for different scenarios now we have considered six different scenarios for load model one now the reason is because you could have the you have vehicles straddling on this on this span or on this span or on this span those are first three considerations the next three consideration is load model one straddling um, one of the national lanes and then you have load model three taking taking um the other national lane so if you look at that's load model one case one and that's case two and you know in the application of this load it has to be done very intelligently along the influence line if you look at these the influence lines were calculated correctly based on the bridge deck these are in line with the load the code consideration and then you must apply the loads that will create the maximum effect along the influence line so this is the load this is the code um, um requirement that was carefully and um, meticulously being followed through now so that's the requirement okay so the code specifies what the adjustment factors to be um, these are adjustment factors that are applied on the wheel load these are adjustment factors to cater for you know abnormal um, um vehicular impact and the type of um, um suspension of the on the wheels okay the suspension type on the wheels so i was referring to case two for load model one and then this case three where you have this straddling the dead lane and then we have case four for load model one 
now case four is when you're combining load model one with load model three okay so load model three is your abnormal vehicular loads okay load model three is the abnormal vehicular loads um let's look at this abnormal vehicular load you see ap applied along the influence line so case three case four case five for load model one is going to be combined with load model three case one in line with the code of practice the code of practice gives us the requirement for combining the loads so it tells you that um, the non simultaneity of um, of traffic actions are combined in compliance with section 4.51 so this table provides the technical requirement for combining a traffic action so both the vertical loads the braking and acceleration forces and then the centrifugal forces and then it specifies what the accompanying value of the variable action should be to determine their corresponding representative values in compliance with BSEN 1990. It also tells you what the vertical and horizontal loads on the bridge, um, walkway and parapet should be and then it tells you how you also derive your LM3 loads. So um, if you look at that, so that's load, load model 3 case 1 and then um, you have load model 3 case 2 when you have when you have it on the other on the other span and then you have it on case 3 where you have it on the third span these are actually derived correctly and along the yield line so the calculations were done to ensure that you know these are some calculations to compute the location of the influence line sorry and then this influence line form the basis of application of these wheel loads now the next thing you have to apply is the braking force you have to calculate the braking force in compliance with the code so these are the braking forces the code specifies that braking forces are applied on the most critical lane which is lane one so this is lane one so braking forces are applied on lane one so sorry so if you look at um lane one okay so it selects lane one so that's lane one this is where the braking the braking forces are actually applied so they were calculated as I showed you earlier on, in compliance with the code, and then um, the braking forces were then applied. Okay, so these are longitudinal braking forces for the um, so okay, good. So these are longitudinal braking forces for the deck. You also calculate braking forces for the abutments. The way you derive it for the abutment is different from how it is derived for the deck. So you can see. Um, for lane one, you have 562.5 kilo newton. That's what you have there. You can see that's what was applied. Now um, you then move to calculate the centrifugal force for LM1. Um, mind you, you calculate the braking force for LM1 and then braking force for LM3 as well too. Okay, the code specifies that you apply it at the critical point. Then centrifugal force. Okay, when the when the vehicle is turning, um, those are forces that that uh, that that acts along the center of rotation okay centrifugal point tends to pull a rigid body towards the center okay so the code specifies how centrifugal forces are, are, are derived and then how you apply it specify that you apply it at the most critical point on the bridge deck which is at the centroid of the bridge deck now for the elastometric bearing expansion um, the expansion loads were calculated based on the characteristics of the bearing parts these are obtained from vendor information and then you determine the shear stiffness and then from that shear stiffness you calculate the expansion due to temperature variation and then you then calculate the force due to expansion restraint force right and then this is elastometric bearing for contraction was also done and then we have the the thermal gradient on the bridge deck this is a thermal gradient on the bridge deck this was derived based on this so if you look at um what we showed you ab initio on the bridge deck we had thermal this is the non-linear thermal variation this is in line with euro code one five euro code one five gives you the requirement for thermal analysis of bridges so you can see the variation of temperature variation based on the thickness of your bridge deck okay so this is what you use in deriving the thermal loads now you then apply loads on the abutment. Abutment load criteria is also different. You have the um, you have the LM1 for the abutment, LM2, LM3. You derive them in line with the code of practice. 
you have the active head stress you have the at rest head stress you also have to derive these correctly and apply them together with your centroid because we use that to check the stability at equilibrium limit state stability at dual limit state which is sliding and overturning and then you know you use this um, this then we have the um the footway okay so these are the pedestrian footway this is life flow the code specifies and then you have the parapets these are the parapets um, so the code specifies that on your parapets you have to specify um, a minimum imposed load of um, let's look at what the code specifies. I think 1.6 kilonewton per meter Okay, so the code states that on the parapet you need to apply the minimum load of one kiloton per meter. Okay, uh, these are the life loads. So parapets are subjected to both dead loads and then life load in line with EN thirteen seventeen um, dash six. So this is the vertical loads on the parapet, and then you have the lateral loads on the parapet as well too. Okay, the code specifies that. So these are lateral loads on the parapet. Then we have the footway accidental loads I told you about. So these are the accidental loads as a result of you know abnormal vehicular transversing into the pedestrian footway. So you compute these and then apply them correctly. Then these are the wind loads. You have to calculate the wind loads. Um, wind loads are not applied on the deck but applied on the parapet. Section eight of BS year nineteen ninety one four provides the requirements of wind load. The way you analyze wind loads on bridges is not the same way wind loads are applied on other category of building structures. Okay, so you need to make reference to your code one eight to see the guidelines. Okay, so they are applied on the piers, um, on the parapets, um, wind definitions were already um, defined somewhere around there and these were used in developing and generating what the wind loads are in the various directions. You know, so as soon as you do this, the next thing is to develop your varied load cases, your load combinations. Sorry, your load combinations are going to uh, follow the requirement of EN 1990 2005. There's the latest EN 1990 2005 that captures combination for bridges. Um, you're going to also um, perform your load combination in, in compliance with that EN 1990, which specifies the design on that transient. Um, you're going to design bridges under transient condition when the abutments are installed and the bridge deck is not available. Stability of the abutment when um, the rollers are compacting the soil up onto the abutment and you have heavy vehicular loads. You're going to analyze the bridge. I didn't even mention we have um, braking forces that are actually transferred to the abutments. Let's look at um, breaking forces on the abutment because these are part of the loads that will be catered for in the an analysis of the abutment um, okay and uh, we can see that's it here. Approach abutment longitudinal braking forces. So these are braking forces that are actually applied on the abutment. You know, the code specifies that the abutment must be designed for braking forces as well. So it gives the criteria for the braking forces to be considered in the yeah, this is the code requirements um, on the abutment. You must design for this category of braking forces. That acts at the top of your abutment. So this is exactly what was done. It was calculated and computed, and then applied on the abutment. Okay. Um, so these are what you use in developing. So you're going to have several load combinations. Load combinations catered for construction phase. Load combination under installation phase. Load combination under the bridge proper operating condition, and then you're going to have your geo structural and then your equilibrium limit state for the stability of the abutment and so on so these combinations are going to form your criteria in the structural engineering analysis of your bridge super sub and then foundation structures thank you very much for your time
um, call that whatever questions you may have you could just you know put it down on the um, chat tab or you could make your comments as usual thank you